So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining from. Um, I'd like to welcome you to, the, to this session on the future of research assessment in the open science era. Um, on behalf of myself and Dr. Jadranka Stojanovsky, um, who's an assistant professor at the University of Zara, um, we'd like to welcome you. Um, and I'd also like to wel welcome our panelists, uh, Dr. Anna Hatch, Program Director of DORA, um, Dr. Mario Maliki, Co-Editor-in-Chief of Research Integrity and Peer Review, Alex Menezes, uh, Senior Vice President of Global Health Strategies, um, and Dr. Polina Tindana, who's a Senior Lecturer at the University of Ghana. Um, this panel uh, is going to be maybe a little bit different from some of the others that um, uh, have taken place at the conference, but I think it follows really well off of uh, the keynote that hopefully some of you just uh, uh, listened to. Um, we aren't going to do slides. Um, we're going to try and have a little bit more of a discussion and a guided conversation. Um, so. The areas that we are going to touch on are uh, research assessment as it plays out within the sciences, um, frameworks that are in place for research assessment, um, and also research integrity and peer review as it relates to research assessment. And then we're also going to take a look at research assessment by uh, a, a different set of stakeholders or a different set of entities and how um, science is used to inform policymaking. Um, and as the keynote from uh, Dr. Badra uh, in the previous session laid out the importance of communicating um, and building capacity and trust of citizens who need to act on the results of research. And given that um, uh, we're covering such a broad swath of types of research assessment, um, I asked the panelists um, to try and uh, make sure that we're very clear in each one of these sort of case studies that we're talking about, um, that we take a look at and are explicit about what is actually being assessed. Is it the research itself, the output of research, or the researcher doing the actual work? Who is doing the assessment? And then for what purpose? So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hopefully we can have all of the panelists um, welcome to you all. Um, and I, I think I will start uh, uh, with Anna. Um, Anna, if you would be willing to introduce yourself and provide an overview of DORA and some of the highlights of research assessment frameworks, that would be great. Absolutely, thank you so much, Brian. Really excited to be thought, part of such a thoughtful panel and share some of DORA's work that's really focused on supporting systems change at academic institutions. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, DORA is an international nonprofit initiative to improve the ways that researchers are assessed in academia. We're supported by 16 different organizations that include research funders, publishers, scholarly societies, and academic libraries. And you can see the full list of supporters on DORA's website. And sort of as our name implies, the DORA stands for the Declaration on Research Assessment. Um, and the idea to write the declaration really came out of the 2012 ASCB annual meeting where there was a community conversation of researchers and academic editors from what I heard sort of at the poster hall that started discussing um, how in journal-based metrics were having impacts on the reward and incentive system, um, really starting to influence sort of who was getting rewarded, what that meant for the composition of the workforce, what, what these metrics were measuring um, versus what was trying to be measured. Um, and also thinking about the ways that their influence was having on research culture and the ways that research was being conducted. Um, so this discussion, led to the declaration that was then published in 2013. Um, and while there's a number of different recommendations for a variety of academic stakeholders, there are two main ones, um, which is to stop using journal-based metrics for hiring, promotion, and funding decisions. Um, 
and to start considering the value and impact of all of research contributions. And really from the time that it was published all the way up until 2017, the declaration was collecting signatures um, and raising awareness within the community. Um, but in 2017, it was kind of a big inflection point for us. So a group of organizations came together and started recognizing that while the declaration was successful at bringing attention to the need for culture change, they weren't seeing um, the widespread change that they had hoped to see. Um, and this is really um, was a turning point where Zora sort of transitioned from a policy document into an active initiative really to help support and facilitate culture change. And I think this, this is, transition is so important because research assessment is very difficult to solve, um, primarily because it can be considered as a systems challenge. It involves multiple stakeholders um, and making this even more difficult is the fact that individual interventions are not going to be effective. Um, so point solutions cannot solve systems challenges. Instead, um, to solve this type of challenge, it really requires a collaborative systems approach that addresses the underlying culture, infrastructure, um, and conditions. So, so we, we take that point sort of very seriously and try to think about, you know, what are the ways that DORA can help to cultivate it? responsible research assessment and really work to change the system itself. Um, so we do that um, primarily through community building and engagement, knowledge sharing, um, and resource development sort of with the community to sort of help support and facilitate change at academic institutions and funding organizations. Um, I think, you know, really relevant to today's conversation is that we have these grand societal challenges right now um, that are demanding research to identify solutions, you know, thinking about climate change, continuing to curb um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but we also know that research assessment drives researcher behavior and helps set these research agendas. So a big question is how can we align these priorities and societal challenges with the ways that researchers are evaluated. Um, so, you know, keeping that in mind and also thinking of sort of what's the state of play, um, where are we at? So in, in general, I'd say, you know, DORA, in addition to collecting signatures, um, all of the organizations who signed DORA really form a community of practice to improve the ways that research is assessed. Um, we've seen a number of these organizations now starting to announce plans to approach research assessment. Um, and there have been a few who sort of moved into that next phase of policy development and implementation. Um, but really where we're seeing is that the majority of organizations are falling into that sort of have made commitments to change, have announced plans. And the next big step moving forward is working on policy development and implementation. Awesome. Is that is that answer your question? It was a little bit long. That's perfect. <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you, Anna. Um, next up is Mario Maliki. Um, Mario, you're an editor of uh, a journal on research integrity and peer review. Uh, I'm curious how you see research assessment through those uh, lenses. Thank you, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, so my role is sort of twofold always. One is the lens of research integrity, which we can consider to be in the role of codes of conduct when how we implement them. And in a way we can think of DORA as that, but the problem with DORA is, as Anna mentioned, organizations need to sign up. So there is no overarching binding um, policy that forces countries around the world or even individual organizations to follow a very strict guide on how to do researcher assessment or research assessment itself. If we look at the European Code of Research Integrity, there's nothing in it directly related to research assessment or to assessment of researchers themselves. So a new and a new uh, European scoping report that just came out on reforming policy says we first need to come up with a document that would bind things. Um, as a general editor, you can, when you evaluate research, force 
researchers to use, for example, reporting guidelines, most famous being consort for randomized controlled trial. You can find ways thinking that if we implement a certain policy, we will improve the quality of the science that is being reported, maybe even conducted if they consulted, you know, when they're planning the study. I think the same applies for any kind of conduct that we do or guidance when we look at how we're going to assess researchers. It would be great that there are overarching things, but if we're moving towards an open science and open transparency of things, there is a very nice sentence that I'm going to quickly copy here um, in, in the chat for people to see. When we look at the European um, code of conduct for research integrity, it says we should be communicating research in a transparent, fair and full and unbiased way. It doesn't say we should be communicating research assessment in that way. It doesn't say we should be communicating assessment of researchers in that way. So we don't have a code currently that binds us to do something. Uh, and so I applaud all of these initiatives, but they come to and often fail because they tackle only some researchers. I do think that we will get there in maybe 10 or 20 years that all of, all of us will agree to a set of set of standards. But right now it's very different. Like you have 40,000 or 50,000 journals around the world, some of them evaluate and use peer review very differently than others do. Some funders use open peer review, some don't. The same is with research or researcher assessment. If we talk about researchers being assessed, how many of you know how many applicants applied for the same position you were applying? Do you get to see their CVs? What has happened? And I think in this light, I always look at it. If we are moving towards an open, transparent way of assessing research and researchers, should two different external panels come to the same conclusion? And this is where we struggle with peer review. Interrater agreement and peer review has been always shown to be incredibly low. Now, when we are moving to any kind of open and transparent way of assessing research itself or researchers without a set of criteria and without the ability that do, these two external panels will come to the same inclusions, it means that we have different criteria. And these need to be acknowledged. We often don't talk about them. So what I hope to see is that we actually make these criteria for assessment much more clear, much more transparent, and then see where we can go from there. Great, thank, thank you, Mario. And uh, as for the question that Mike asked, I'll reply in the chat. So. Perfect. Um, so that's great. And you know, thanks to Anna and Mario to give uh, for giving uh, their remarks sort of about research assessment within the sciences and between um, science organizations and scientists who are conducting research. Uh, I'd like to pivot a little bit right now um, and uh, introduce my colleague, uh, Alex Menezes, um, who's Senior Vice President of uh, Global Health Solutions and uh, works in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, working with uh, the Ministry of Health there um, to start to think through how uh, some of his experiences around um, conducting research, evaluating research as it relates to uh, policy and policy uptake, in particular, as it relates to um, health research and in particular, um, in, you know, in the pandemic as we're seeing it right now. So Alex, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you for the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure to participate in the discussion. I'm, I'm um, new to this world, but have not been new to the field of health research. I've been uh, working in this space for, for many years. I actually started working uh, in this space as, as an advocate, as a, as a health advocate uh, working in HIV response uh, in the 90s and uh, following research uh, and its impact very, very closely. Now I actually manage uh, relationships and programs that fund research and, and generate uh, that impact that I was uh, tracking from uh, sort of the user side, if you will. Um, and I, I think that it's very clear to me that science, you know, never happens in a vacuum and there, and especially in the field of public health, uh, their projects are expected to generate uh, not only uh, rigorous results uh, that are ethically sound, but also uh, have an impact and help guide policy and improve lives ultimately. Uh, and 
and we, you know, in the programs we fund, and I'll talk a little bit about this, uh, the, the programs we've been working with, especially with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the government of Brazil, uh, we've created sort of a, a bit of an ecosystem for supporting uh, projects that are very closely related uh, to policy needs. And, and once you start funding the research, of course, the number one criteria has to be um, effective um, the sound methodology and uh, and 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 robust uh, uh, scientific approach and but that's just the start of it. Uh, in in these programs, I, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the lessons, or I wouldn't call them lessons necessarily, but sort of the elements that we um, that we uh, I have applied towards this program that I I think make them particularly effective in in delivering results that are. Uh, closer to what policymakers might expect. And in this context, specifically, we're talking about programs that are funded with public funds, uh, public funds that actually come from uh, the policy budget, sort of the health policy budget, and not necessarily uh, just academic research funding, but um, have a specific bias towards uh, the impact on policy. And, and from that regard, uh, I think there's there's there, there's some interesting elements that I want to want to discuss. Uh, over we funded over sixty projects uh, with multiple durations uh, through various programs, from topics from uh, maternal and newborn child health uh, to malaria to uh, antimicrobial resistance. And I, I think, but I think there are three elements that we've somehow somehow tried to keep consistent throughout these programs that uh, have I think yielded interesting results. So so the first one is policymaker ownership. Uh, we have really focused on developing a program that has policymakers involved from setting the priorities to um, helping select the projects so uh, that they're relevant uh, to the, the, the questions that are being asked uh, and actually ensure that there are some interactions between policymakers and the researchers throughout the process when, when the project is being implemented so that the results will ultimately uh, be closer to uh, uh, the applicability that they were in originally intended for. So there's always some fine tuning at the end, et cetera. Um, there's, uh, so we, we try to keep uh, this policymaker engagement almost like as if it applied to the entire life cycle of, 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 of the research project. Um, the, uh, there's also another element of, of that that's uh, the use of administrative data sets in one specific program, we've used administrative data sets, data that has been collected through delivery of health services uh, and have turned that uh, as uh, an opportunity for investigative, for investigations and research that actually helps derive um, interesting lessons uh, and, and, and insights from that data. And, and, and in that case, I think there's another layer of accountability because these, pro as, as you work with uh, data that has been generated uh, through public health programs, it's really important that, that, that those learnings actually feed back to the programs. Um, I think the second component I want to highlight uh, is this idea of uh, not only you need the policymaking engagement, but uh, we've been encouraging researchers to really think through uh, what outputs they're, they're pursuing. And the diversity of outputs is really important. All research programs we supported have delivered uh, on um, the traditional research outputs, academic papers, you know, peer reviewed and, and uh, preferably in, in, in solid um, publications. But in addition to that, we've always encouraged researchers to actually generate, uh, whenever applicable, it doesn't apply to all projects, but generate uh, uh, other formats in which their data could be put to use. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So in one researcher looking at uh, potential risks uh, on vaccine related to vaccination coverage, air, identifying areas uh, in which vaccination coverage was not uh, optimal and therefore those areas were still subject to uh, vaccine preventable disease outbreaks. Uh, we, uh, that research actually created a, a full dashboard and, and put that online. Uh, both for the population, but especially for policymakers to identify, map that risk, and be able to 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 act on this to improve uh, vaccination coverage. So, in a way, the, this was a data sciences project, very much focused on on translating that data to make it more actionable uh, from a policy perspective. Uh, I think the the 
the third point that I, I want to cover uh, at this point, uh, which is, I think, the, the, the third point uh, in terms of the elements that the, the three core elements, uh, as I mentioned, uh, policymaker ownership, the diversity of outputs, and, and I think the last one, which I think is particularly relevant at this point, is the ability to pivot. Uh, and we've been uh, with these programs through two epidemic outbreaks, or, or uh, in, in, in one case, actually a pandemic, which were the, the Zika uh, outbreak in, in Brazil in 2016, 2015, 2016, and uh, in, in which we had a whole set of projects being funded in the maternal newborn child health space. Um, and uh, more recently, of course, COVID, which has affected all our lives. Um, and in both cases, uh, it was crucial for the researchers that had the funding to pursue uh, related questions to actually pivot and be able to not only assess the impact uh, of, um, of, of these outbreaks uh, or health emergencies on their research question per se, but in some cases, we were able to generate uh, some supplemental funding to allow uh, for generation of new data and information ab about that helped address those emergencies. So I'll, I'll stop there. I think there's a lot of food for thought, and and but clearly this is a different uh, perspective. I'm not in academia, uh, so I I, I have a, a quite different perspective on on some of the points you guys are raising. That's perfect, Alex. That's exactly why you were invited uh, for that different perspective. Um, so next up was supposed to be Paulina Tindana. Uh, unfortunately, Paulina has had some internet connectivity issues this evening. Um, she is an, assist, uh, an assistant uh, professor at the University of Ghana in Accra. Um, and so um, in lieu of having uh, Paulina um, be able to talk about her amazing work, I do want to at least highlight a, a little bit of the work that she's doing. Um, and, you know, building off of what Alex was saying about the importance of um, research in order to inform policy that impacts um, actual citizens uh, it, as it relates to health research, uh, there's this additional component that is necessary that again, um, Dr. Badra the, in the last keynote made reference to, which is if you're wanting those policies that go into place to be maximally effective, the citizens need to have trust in the research process um, and in the research that's being conducted in order for them to make meaningfully meaningful decisions around um, the policies that are being put into place or even just their own um, trust and or uh, adoption of um, behavioral changes. And so some of the work that Paulina has done, um, she has done a lot of work in the field, uh, actually interfacing with research participants and community members in Ghana as it relates to um, biomedical research. Uh, she did this really amazing project that um, showed research participants the journey of their biospecimen samples when they were asked to uh, provide biospecimens, um, they created a video that showed exactly what the process was um, for everything from taking a blood sample to loading it into you know this specific type of storage device to driving it to the research facility, showing how it's processed, showing how it's analyzed, um, really trying to demystify a lot of um, what is often opaque um, for research participants um, in, in the hope that um, their trust in the scientific process, their willingness uh, not only to participate in a specific research process, um, but for them to actually act on the results from that would hopefully be bolstered. And so Unfortunately, uh, Paulina wasn't able to um, join us. I still hold out hope she will we'll be able to join by uh, the end of our discussion. Um, but at this point, um, I think you know I see a lot of going a lot going on in the chat here. Um, but I think the first thing I want to do is direct a question back to Anna and Mario. Um, so. Now that you two have heard a little bit about um, research assessment and its importance for 
um, the development of policy and um, communication with uh, parties that are not just other scientists. I'm curious if either of you have thoughts on uh, ways in which researchers could be incentivized um, in order to um, think about research, their research, and the audience that they're um, uh, communicating to. Absolutely. I'm happy to jump in on this. Um, and I think, you know, I'd mentioned before that, you know, research assessment and how especially researchers are evaluated drives behavior um, and has influences on what types of research are even being conducted. Um, so as part of one of DOOR's activities, um, a collaboration with the European University Association and Spark Europe, um, DOOR launched Reimagining Academic Assessment last December. It's a case study or a case study repository um, from universities and national consortia that really seeks to highlight the key elements of institutional change to improve academic assessment. Um, and I talked a little bit before about sort of the change pattern that DOOR is seeing right now is sort of you know, the announcement of plans, the development of policy, and then its implementation. And our goal really with these case studies is to understand, you know, how do these policies come into being? Um, who was involved in that process? What does it look like? What are the motivations? What is the timeline for change as a way to sort of increase knowledge sharing with the community? Um, and one of these I think is particularly relevant for our discussion today, um, which is the Open University in the United Kingdom. And I'm happy to drop the link into the chat once I answer. Um, but sort of as you might expect um, from the university's name, um, they have sort of an embedded commitment to openness, engagement, knowledge exchange, um, and took sort of an evidence approach to research assessment reform. Um, so initially, sort of they, public, they published an impact framework um, really to examine where they were as a university and how they wanted to chart, move forward um, to promote um, assessment, um, not only assessment of sort of knowledge exchange, public engagement, societal impacts, um, but how they could that embed that then within the research assessment system. Um, and what it ended up happening was sort of through the sponsorship of the pro vice chancellor um, who's responsible for professional development, he created a diverse working group to rethink the academic promotion criteria. And ultimately this led to something called the knowledge exchange profile, which is a new promotion route um, that professors can use um, to be promoted in their jobs. Um, and I believe it's sort of as of its introduction in 2015, six professors have been promoted through this knowledge exchange profile. And so it's a different type of, it, it's a different framework for assessment for a different track of researchers, is that correct? Exactly, yeah. So traditionally there's sort of the, the, the research, research track um, and teaching and service um, is valued, but this is a separate track um, that really is there to recognize contributions to public engagement specifically. Um, and yes, I see a question in the chat. I'll, I'm happy to drop a link in there. Um, and I think what's what I really like about this approach too is that um, they built in an assessment working group that continues to perform sort of a survey every other year to explore sort of different aspects of their new criteria so they can continually optimize and refine. Awesome. Um, Mario, you put something in, in the chat here, which is intriguing to me, um, where you're talking about grant peer review for funders. Funders are often also um, tied to policymakers, but they're not often the exact same entity. And so I'm curious if you, from your expect, uh, your perspective, how you have seen that play out in the, in the peer review of, of grants. Sorry, I was just posting another thing in the chat. Um, Again, these case studies are wonderful, but we are talking today about more than 25,000 universities around the world and around 50,000 
journals and approximately, I think around 20,000 funders. So if we are trying to streamline a process, it is very different working, coming, for example, in Croatia, when I knew when I was uh, starting as a young research assistant, that I had national guidelines of the minimum number of papers that I need to have to be promoted to associate professor, full professor and everything else. And if I decided to stay at the university, if I fulfill those quota, when a position opens, I'm guaranteed to get it. If I meet minimum requirements. This very much differs between different universities, especially when we come to when a person changes from one country to another country or to another institution, what are the rules they need to do? So we can promote a lot of things that you need to have, but it's often unclear when an institution is looking to fill in position within their rank that also serve the societal purpose of providing a paycheck and you know, supporting for its citizens versus picking the most best researcher from that field or somewhere else. So if we build transparent dashboards for researchers around the world, then universities will be not like right now having an open call for maybe researchers, they may go to that and directly approach people who they want to hire instead of having public calls like we do that right now. Similar can be said on research funders. Research funders differ between those that are you know, uh, government owned or European Commission or things like that. We have a specific fund of money that they need to spend. So they have calls that are very wide compared to research compared to some funders that have specific things like private funders who want a specific answer being done. And then they will have for that specific question, everyone around the world applying for the same research project, seeing who writes a better proposal. And I think this is what we need to consider. When we are thinking about research assessment and researchers assessment, whatever we promote and whatever researchers can, can do in their own CVs ultimately ends being dependent on what is the top-down approach. If you need a certain number of publications for your research, if that's what is being compared to you get another position, in some countries that may be the number of grants that you um, obtain, or how much money or how much money you can bring to the institutions, where in others that doesn't play a role at all. So it is a very different play field, I think, to go to what we want. And making this transparent is wonderful, but it may only, but it may only increase those universities that want to play the something that I call an industry game. If we're working in industry, if you're working in tech, if you're working in many private industries, you have recruiting companies, specialized recruiting companies that you know look for talent and get those people to work in those companies. You have much more companies investing in assessment than we do at universities. So it's a very, you know, it depends on what kind of society we want to build rather than you know, just what we want to put on CV. I can promote a lot of things on my CV, what I think are more important than others. But if those are not going to be considered for recruiters by LinkedIn or whoever, it doesn't matter. If I need something for Switzerland, if I want to apply for Switzerland, I need to know how the system is there, which is very different than something in Japan or in Thailand. Absolutely. Um, There's a question from David Schaden. I'm going to come back to that one. Um, uh, and and jump to one uh, for Alex. Um, so Mike asks, uh, from a policy government funder perspective, how do you adjust for the varying pressures, backgrounds, assessments of researchers? I even imagine researchers from Northern Brazil have gone through a different experience than Southern. Um, yeah. Sorry, I think that's, a, I was just, uh... It somewhat does somewhat relates to the previous uh, discussion we were, were going through here because it's it's been really interesting to use these experiments in which you know there's a uh, relevance for policy element uh, that comes into the selection process uh, when we we do these calls for proposals uh, typically they they actually engage two different agencies one that's a typical traditional research funder and the Ministry of Health. One that, uh, which CNPQ, which is uh, the National Council of Research, actually acts as the disperser of the funds, uh, and they uh, have a whole system for assess for for selecting proposals, which they do and apply for the majority of academic grants in Brazil. But for these programs specifically, uh, 
because of the policy considerations, the relevance of the considerations, that actually opens the door for researchers to be assessed for their uh, ideas and for the best proposals, not only for their CVs and for, the, for their academic credentials, which is typically a very high, um, uh, a very important advantage in the typical CMPQ selection process. So for these specific calls, we made it, make it very clear that you know, there, there are different weights to, to, ele to the elements that are being evaluated and uh, policy relevance being uh, a very important one. Um, and in that regard, uh, it's crucial that you actually look at the diversity of the applicants and, and the, perspective, the different perspectives that they bring uh, and their ability to work with different populations. So, it's, uh, so we've been uh, over the years uh, uh, increasingly better at uh, looking at that geographic diversity, but very much from the start because of this element of, of looking at the policy relevance, we've always been able to bring in young investigators into the fold. So it, this hasn't been, uh, although it's been a program, a program for um, scientific excellence, it hasn't been just a program for veteran scientific excellence. Uh, there's been a lot of um, new blood coming into the system, which in, in mo more recently, we've been particularly focused on ensuring that uh, geographic diversity so that we're actually catering to different populations. Great. Um, shifting a little bit and, and jumping back to uh, David Shadden's question, um, how worried are panel members about the creeping commercial dominance of scholarly analytical data used for research assessment? I've just answered that one in chat, so maybe some other people can go have, have at. Anna, do you want to speak to that at all? Yeah, I think uh, I'm just sort of <laughs> looking at sort of the question again in the chat. You know, one of the main sort of tenets of DORA, in addition to sort of let's not use journal based metrics and focus on holistic evaluation, is that aspect of being transparent about how researchers. Are evaluated. Um, and a lot of sort of the scholarly analytical data that's held by commercial publishers um, is sort of still, still closed off. Um, and so I think that is clearly, clearly a challenge. And I think when we're looking at some of the other the other um, aspects of that too, is that there's an overrepresentation of data from the global north in these databases. Um, so when you think about geographic equity, um, there are clear disparities there. Um, but I'd be very curious to hear sort of what Alex thinks of this from a funder, funder perspective and, a, and, and the evaluation of proposals. I think it, it depends a lot on what exactly is 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 the ask, right? I think there there's a uh, but if if there, in in in, in many cases uh, because I work with RFPs, typically it's not uh, ongoing uh, proposals uh, that are submitted. Uh, there is always an ask, and that ask should be tweaked <laughs> to ensure uh, uh, to ensure that uh, that diversity is reflected and, and increasingly we're working on on efforts that not only generate um, uh, new proposals and interesting uh, research uh, applications uh, but also generate new data sets so uh, there's a whole set of projects that we've been working with on uh, on, on our data sciences rfps that have generated uh, data sources that, that have combined data sources that uh, may or may not have been public previously, and, and then uh, have fed back those data sources to the open science space to generate uh, uh, sources that can actually be used by other researchers. So it's, 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 it's not an easy uh, answer, and, and it's not an easy process. There's a lot of uh, trial and error. Uh, it's not quick, but I think there, there, there's an interesting element of generating um, uh, more opportunities for uh, 
researchers based on um, on, on these RFPs. I think there's a there, there's an accumulative effect. And and in those RFPs that you're evaluating, how you know you mentioned um, there being a, a, a heavy weight on uh, policy, um, how it relates to policy. How much is weighted as far as um, the researcher who is um, actually submitting the proposal? Because that's part of what we're talking about here: is how how do you how do you assess the uh, not just the research proposal itself, but the actual researcher, or, or do you not take that into account? Is it a is it a blind review? So it is, and there's some, some of these projects actually do have an initial phase that's a blind review, but before the selection, there is uh, uh, a, 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 a moment in which we actually do we unblind and 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 have, there's a conversation with the policymakers about development. And I think uh, uh, and I. I absolutely hear the point that these are small experiments and so we're not talking about something that can be applied broadly but it, it is or, or ex, uh, in, in, uh, indefinitely applied I should say but it can be applied more broadly that for sure but not indefinitely uh, but in these cases specifically I think there what we've been looking at primarily has been the feasibility if that researcher actually has the credentials to deliver on that project and less about uh, their ability to, to uh, their, their track record of academic excellence, uh, but do, do they come from a reputable, uh, from an institution that's solid enough to actually carry out an ambitious research project, or do they have the expertise, do they have the proper team, you know, if, they, if, if the teams, if the permission on the team is available, that's also considered, but it's mostly a con when the policy is the driver, these these RFPs have looked primarily as uh, feasibility as a main criteria in terms of the capacity of the research. Perfect. Um, there was another question that came across in the Q&A. Are there specific metrics that are important to stakeholders beyond academia, i.e. to policymakers, industry, legal, et cetera? Um, for example, I imagine number of papers doesn't matter much in industry as impact for policymakers on the ground experience might matter more the number of lectures. Um, and Mario re replied in there. Um, and I'll say from, from my perspective, you know, it, for instance, funding proposals that are going to the National Institutes of Health in the US, uh, they have changed their biosketch formats recently to have uh, less uh, emphasis on number of publications. And instead, they um, ask for three areas of impact of your research, and they ask you to write essentially a, a little mini abstract with supporting references. It's not like they're not um, uh, asking for proof that you're able to publish, but really um, trying to push um, researchers in, in that domain um, to be more explicit about what impact their research is actually having and what what changes are, are happening. Anna, you want to chime in? Yeah, and they're, they're not the only research funder that has been doing that. Um, so DORA also has a community of practice specifically for research funders. Um, we have quarterly meetings to discuss um, sort of new, new ideas about assessment, what organizations have been working on, and a common theme throughout the past year um, has been the development of something called sort of a narrative CV, which is really sort of reimagining the traditional CV um, into a structured format where you can have written descriptions of different types of contributions. Um, so I think the most common one, in addition of, to sort of the biosketch in the US, is this resume for researchers, which was developed by the Royal Society in the United Kingdom. So that has four four different sections to describe sort of impact on sort of your research impact, um, societal impact, um, impact on sort of tra trainee development. Um, and there's a, there's another category that of course now that I'm on the spot I can't can't quite think of. Um, but the goal of this type of CV is to really be able to reconceptualize what is impact, um, make room for a broader, broader array of achievements. Um, different funders have been implementing it. Um, so I know Science Foundation Ireland has implemented a version of it, as has the Luxembourg 
um, National Research Fund, as well as um, the Dutch Research Council has also implemented a narrative CD and the Swiss National Science Foundation has implemented um, a version of a narrative CV that they've created called SciCV. So it's definitely a trend that we're starting to see um, within our funder community. If I may comment a little bit on that, I have to say personally, I'm not a huge fan of narrative CV, even though the European Scoping Review um, report on research assessment actually encourages them, because we've seen in many applications of students to universities that um, we don't all have the same literacy, literacy skills in writing a very good narrative. And uh, people sometimes like the hard numbers, even though they're very wrong to assess impacts because they're not, they're not susceptible to how good you are in writing possible English or anything of it. If you had narrative CV templates, that you could only use specific sentences or specific adjectives or pick between three sentences, this would be maybe a fair playing ground. But if we will be assessing how good someone writes or uses a specific wording in it, compared to not actually telling us what has been done, that's a very tricky thing. And there have been some, thanks to Dora and uh, your projects, there've been some nice reports where we've seen that peer reviewers trying to examine narrative CVs while they appreciate them, don't know how to directly compare a narrative CV of one researcher compared to the other one, which one is better. And this has often been easier when you have a numerical sort of thing, because you can say if the funder or if the institution wants more of these, then you can have them more of these. That is not often that simple in a narrative CV. While they're yeah. better to capture some things, it's harder, I think, to directly compare accomplishments between researchers. Yeah, I think there's definitely room for optimization, for sure. And I think sort of, you know, the benefits are is that it allows you to put a variety of outputs down. So you're not just restricted to sort of lists on a page. And I think what it also does is give researchers some control back over their own narrative, rather than have evaluators look at a CV and draw their own conclusions. But as you rightly point out, Mario, you, you, we have to consider the impacts on individuals who might not be a native speaker of a language. We also need to consider the influence of sort of like gendered language. Um, are women going to be evaluated differently than men? How do we accommodate for that? So I think there's a lot of you know, room for conversation about sort of mitigating biases an optimizing process for sure. So I think what this is, part of what this is highlighting is this constant tension between, you know, the quantitative and qualitative assessments um, that are honestly both necessary. Um, and that tension is good. And that tension is hopefully going to lead us to a spot where we can quantify what should be quantified and, um, you know, there's a whole field of mixed methods research that could potentially allow for uh, a different type of assessment in this in this problem space where, um, you know, an initial qualitative assessment is done and then it's quantitative from that point uh, forward. Um, there's one more question from Mike and I'm going to um, take that and, and twist it a, a little bit um, because there's one last question that I wanted to um, to ask as well. So the question was around, uh, Mario, Mario, you just answered it. It moved to the wrong tab. Um, how do you all, how do you all view as the crux of the problem in this problem space from your perspective and what change would make the biggest impact on that problem? And, and this is, this I think goes right along with, uh, where you see research assessment evolving in the coming years. Um, which is sort of where I wanted to um, end the panel. Um, in particular, if, if you think there are any sea changes on the horizon, if there are big changes that you think um, may totally change the way that um, research and researchers are being assessed. Alex, do you wanna give it a, a crack first? I can, although it's it's uh, assessing researchers other than for funding proposals is 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 not. I'm much my my field is much more the looking at um, 
making sure research is relevant uh, for, for, for the problems we're trying to solve. Uh, but I, I do feel like that, that there's one point that was brought up in the Q&A that I, that I think in, it applies here, which is how, what will be, be the impact of the pandemic in this? Because uh, I think the pandemic has completely changed the way uh, we process information that's coming from research uh, and uh, the, the level of research literacy the you know, I, I've worked on HIV vaccines for a number of years. Um, uh, and, and it's, it, to me, it was fascinating process to see, you know, neighbors, friends, <laughs> parents talking about, you know, some really complex, uh, clinical trial concepts <laughs> that were actually informing efficacy, applicability, duration of protection, et cetera, which have significant relevance for all our lives and and suddenly we're all following that so i think uh ultimately how uh society was able to actually assess the outputs of of this research pipeline that uh, that was generated to to address the pandemic i think is uh, is going to have a lasting impact on 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 all of us and especially for health research but uh, probably for other fields as well yeah, fascinating to watch it unfold in real time. Fascinating and sometimes terrifying. Yeah, uh, because it's it's not always used effectively. Also, <laughs> so it's a, there are also risks related to that. Exactly. Mario or Anne? Anna? Well, I I posted it in the chat. I believe what I would like to see in the future happening is that, um, for example, Orchid becomes the main CV for all researchers around the world, that it's automatically generated based on whatever assessment criteria and things that we collect today with metadata and bibliographic databases, including societal impact of metrics, whatever we think teaching, whatever goes out there, and that those CVs are created automatically by us rather than being susceptible to how good I am in you know, making it prettier or having a better font or you know, getting out there. And that way we would have the same things. Uh, and the rest is, again, I think we always forget the societal impact of hiring pers persons or accepting them. There are quotas that we don't often admit that we want to hire 90% or 95% of researchers belonging from our own country because these are their taxpayers' money if we're talking about public institutions versus private ones who can aim to get whoever they want or not want to get. Researchers want to choose where they live, where they have kids, where they you know, go for holidays. This is an important aspect that is not often captured in, you know, in where we go. Um, and I often think of it as really going back to the students' assessments. We get 50,000 applications per year and you need to choose students on criteria we know that are bad. And those of you who are following things in California know that judges have banned any you know, automatic testing or any standardized tests because they're not equal based on our societal backgrounds. This belongs to research. It's me doing research in Stanford, someone doing, or doing previously in Croatia, we don't have the same starting points, not even for collaborations or the money we can spend in them. And we are being evaluated possibly on the same level. It is not, that fairness is not always taken into account. Really good point. Uh, Anna, you wanna have the last word here. <laughs> I don't know if I wanna have the last word, so someone can <laughs> jump in after me, um, but I'm happy to sort of comment. And I think what I've seen over the past couple of years now is a shift in thinking of, you know, this really is a systems problem that involves academic institutions, research funders, publishers. So how, how can we facilitate this collective action? Um, knowing that some of these individual interventions might not work unless you have that critical infrastructure. So I see the emphasis on the infrastructure as being incredibly important. Um, the other thing I think that really sort of motivates me and encourages me um, is the increased awareness of the need for responsible assessment, but more than that, the thoughtfulness about how research is being assessed. Um, so really looking down, like we were sort of, the discussion we had about the narrative CDs, highlighting its strengths and its weaknesses, what it can and cannot measure, and aligning that back up to, well, what do we want to measure in this situation? Um, what can we use to measure it? What does it? What does each metric or indicator tell us and not? And how can we sort of build out that 
portfolio of view of youth researcher assessment. Um, so I think that sort of thoughtfulness and recognition um, and really willingness to have the dialogue and conversation um, gives me a lot of hope for the future. Hope for the future is a great way to wrap up a panel, I think. Um, there is one last question from Mike, uh, Anna, and Alex, if you can take a look in there. They're uh, asking for a couple of URLs. Um, but while you're working on that, I want to sincerely thank um, all of our panelists for um, their willingness to join us today. Anna, Mario, Alex, on behalf of Jadranka and I, um, and on behalf of the entire organizing committee, I really thank you. Um, this has been a super, super interesting conversation, um, and I look forward to continuing on with the rest of the Force 11, Force 2021 conference. I think there's just a couple sessions left. So thank you all for joining and uh, be well. Thank you so much. It was a delight to be part of the conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for including me. Okay. Bye-bye.